that uh, this has two modes because it has landing gear that raises to keep it out of the way of uh, when you're filming. And um, I obviously already uh, put this into um, what they call landing mode. So when it's in my case, it's in what they call travel mode. So it's easy to do. Um, and typically, as Sean pointed out last week, you turn on your transmitter first, always. Um, and why, do, why, do we do, why is the transmitter always first? So you take up the frequency. Right. 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 So on, this is a very, very intelligent transmitter and, and uh, quad. And I, I brought the Phantom 2 if you guys want to play with that, one of their uh, Vision Plus uh, Phantoms. So just to take this thing down, hopefully. So that takes it back down for tr what they call travel mode. So camera comes off of it. The nice thing about the Inspire versus a lot of the other uh, DJI, the earlier Phantoms, is it doesn't have a removable uh, gimbal and camera, which this does. So this has what they call the X3. And then uh, this was the original camera that came out with it. And then they came out with a much more heavier and better X5 camera, which allows you to basically have a DSLR in the air. So for people that are into photography or videography, this is a big, big step up. And, and it is expensive, but it's a huge step up, much heavier. Uh, the negative points about it is you do lose some flight time. You lose about three minutes of flight time, uh, I'm finding on, on average. But it also gives you a little more stability windy conditions if it's a heavier craft. Um, and, and this is the default. If you guys were to buy one of these, this is the default packet, right? It comes with the camera. Right. How but, much, but not... Roughly how much is this yeah. one? How much is the This is like 3K. How much is that? Right. So like, originally, orig this is the original Inspire, what they call the L1, and it was, it was $3,000. And it comes with the controller. It comes with the controller, and I actually bought the unit with two controllers. So it allows you to actually have a, a cameraman controlling the gimbal and the camera while your pilot just controls the flight of the of And that's our protocol. So whenever we use this, we have two, we, we have, uh, two drone operators. One's operating the camera, one's operating the flight. About how much flight time do you get with that? How much flight time? Typically, I'm getting we'll 18 to 20 minutes. With the little one on that? Yeah. So you really have to know what you're doing. Um, and then how much it, is this guy, did you say? How much is the cost? Yeah. This one, just the, uh, just the gimbal on the camera with one lens, with its uh, DJI lens, is uh, 2000 And then you can buy, the nice thing though is I've got two other lenses, and uh, so I've got two additional Olympus lenses. The so one is a, the, the lens, the DJI lens is a 12 millimeter lens, which is in 35 millimeter terms, is equivalent to 24. And then I bought the Olympus 25, which is equivalent to 50. And then I have the 45, which is equivalent to 90. So, and they do make a zoom, which um, I don't think, uh, I, the reports I've seen on it, they're not that great, but uh, Olympus makes a zoom that goes from 20, 22 to 45. But let's also just, you know, you guys all odd when you said $2,000, right? Yeah. This stuff is incredibly cheap and it's getting cheaper. And if compared to what you otherwise would have had to fly, to get this quality imagery, it's it's very cheap. You guys are looking at it as like, hey, I'm gonna go buy it as a toy. But for a professional piece of equipment, which this qualifies out as under certain levels, it's not that expensive. Especially in the photography world. Uh, I, I don't know if any of you guys are photographers, but yeah. I mean, they, for lenses yeah. and, and stuff, yeah. I mean, this is this is nothing, you know, compared to some of those prices. So um, you're replacing hiring a helicopter. Yeah. Yeah. At, yeah, yeah, at right. you know, thousands right. of dollars. Right. I think, yeah. I think it's about twenty-five grand around a filming helicopter. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's breaking it. Sure. And then losing your There's so many accent. different things, and then the other thing that just don't break it. You'll be fine. Is, <laughs> is the two the two operator setup. Okay, for us, ours is set up that way as well. And and you guys just all talked about it, right? We just talked about how hard is this? Are these things to fly? Just let alone, right? Just flying it. 
Now try and manipulate the camera and do all that other stuff. If you really, you, you know, it takes a lot of time and practice. So separating those two jobs, and we actually separated by three because not only do we have a operator, the guy flying it, we have a camera operator or a, you know some kind of data collector that's doing that side of it, and then we have a spotter. So you know, right now you're flying these little things, and there's a lot going on, but. Um, Later, when we're in the field, we, we're trying to separate some of those jobs so that you don't have so much junk going on in your brain all at once. Um, because this it gets complicated. That is so, cool. Uh, I'll, I'll let Stan keep going, sorry. So, um, I'll give you some other basics um, in terms of the sticks, exactly as, yeah, as so he explained it. They're, yeah, yeah, they're yeah. very much the same. Is that uh, what the camera scene right there? Yes, this is what this is what the camera see and what you can see in this FPV. Uh, it's called the head plate. So I was just and that works off. Just don't pull it super. It's still attached. Yeah, it, it works off HDMI off the controller. Now the Inspire, the the Phantom Pro, the Phantom Three Pro, you can get an adapter for that uh, controller and actually get an HDMI output also. So this is this. This head play uh, goggles, um, it's actually, for, for the type of uh, display you get, it's pretty good. And it's, I think it was about 270 bucks, which is pretty reasonable because a lot of them are from seven, eight hundred dollars And this one, it's extremely light. So yeah. Even though it's, yeah, it's bulky, super light. it looks bulky and big, but it's very comfortable yeah. on your head. And explain to them like what the issue is, why you want that, potentially. Well, one of, one of the issues I have found when flying is, you know, I, I don't look at the quad when I'm flying. I'm looking at my iPad, or if I really, really want to be immersed, then I'll, be, I'll put this on. And the problem is, if you get any kind of distance away, you're going to lose depth of field. <coughs> I, I guarantee it. I've crashed it, so I know. You're going to lose depth of field. And, and that's, that's the real danger. Um, so if you have an iPad and it gives you, I mean, it's looking wherever the camera's looking. Now, the idea is one, I think what you're going to see in the next generation of the Inspire is another camera that's going to be at the nose yeah. and it's going to be an F, what they call a first person view camera. And so whoever's controlling it, that's what they'll see always. And then the cameraman will see whatever he's pointing his gimbal and camera at. Because what happens is, I might be the camera guy, and we're he's flying ways off there, and I turn the camera 90 degrees. So then when he looks on his screen, he sees a tree, and so he goes, "Oh, I'm going to back up," but he doesn't realize that the aircraft is not facing that direction or whatever, and then we have an issue. So. Right. So this like, is our this is our cheesy uh, FPV, which is a welding helmet because we don't have anything as fancy. But. Uh, that's what we have to use. <laughs> can, so can you control the camera too? I, oh yeah. Oh yeah. So, sure. So I'm, I'm controlling the camera. I can pan it. All right. And then I've got a button behind here that's programmable. And I can now go up and down. You can also use the iPad too if you want to, if you want you to touch the and drag. Yeah, yeah, just so kind I, of click and drag. I, yep, yep, I can yep. click and drag it. So but I find that uh, I, I find it a little more difficult to do uh, precise maneuvers with it. But I haven't really uh, spent much time. Doing well, this it doesn't use. do any auto lock, right? Because I was reading an article about the Phantom Four that just came out. Right. And with the iPad, you can like click and create a box, and then you hit press to go, and the thing will like automatically fly there and film right. it. Or you can do auto lock, like I just did my uh, blog on it. You can. It can lock onto vehicles or people. Or, right. So I'm guessing that's new. This, to this actually has some features. It has a, what they call point of interest feature. So you can actually have it follow. I could have it follow me. Okay. So it, it will do that. And then you can do an orbit around a building or around an object. So you can set that up and it's all, it's done all on the iPad. It's all programmable. There are also some third party applications now, quite a few of them. Um, one's called Autopilot, and the other one's called uh, Litchi, I think it is, L-I-T-C-H-I. Um, those are both made 
especially for the Phantom and DTI products and the Inspire. And they have just a host of, of pre-programmable features to make it completely autonomous. Taking off, landing, flying waypoints, um, any course you want, altitudes. So yeah, it's pretty sophisticated and it's gonna get nothing but better. And, and just to be clear, so the Phantom line is sort of the lower line, right? This is, this is sort of the, that's so like, like consumer grade, this is more like prosumer if you're talking about cameras kind of thing. So usually when, when something rolls out in, in, a, in the given company, when they roll something out, if it really works well, it'll, it'll eventually make it into yeah, the other. All, I'm sure you've all seen these. Yeah. So there's, that's, the, that that's, like that's, <laughs> that's kind of like. It's all relative. That's like the second or third <laughs> generation of the, of the Phantom. This is called the Vision Plus. Um, where Did DJI the, makes both of those? Yes, they do. So DJI right now is kind of the company that if you want to just go buy something, pay the money, and, and have everything show up in your doorstep ready to go, they're kind of the leader in that. But there's a lot of other products out there that do very similar stuff or do more complicated things that are just not as user friendly. And you know, Stan's going through all this and we're talking about all these cool features and stuff, and I, I think that there's some potential uses in a lot of their, those, but for right now, I mean, the reality is they're, those are designed for people unlike you guys. Those are designed for people who don't want to take the time to really understand how and what they can do. Now, there are certain people that are using those to their advantage, but I would say the majority of those people, um, those, those uh, uh, different functions, are designed for people that just don't really know how to fly the aircraft in general. Because you can do all that same thing from just what we're teaching you right here. Yeah, it might take you a little bit longer, but ultimately that's the goal is that you're going to be proficient enough and that and forward thinking enough that if you want to use these these tools um, and the technologies for certain things, then please do so. But we're not we're not trying to train you to use these tools, if, if, if that makes sense, right? We're trying to train you to be a professional, safe yes, yes, operator. Exactly. And then as doing so, these you know different cool features are available to you. Um, but the reality is uh, yeah, I mean, the, the follow me and all that stuff, I, it's cool, but I, I guess I'm, I'm just having a hard time following all that stuff just from the fact of, I don't know why I can't, somebody just can't fly the aircraft and follow the guy, you know? Like, I don't understand why it has to do it by itself, you know? So, because we like to make things easier as, sure. as human but, nature. But what we're doing is we're pulling that responsibility out of it. So we're taking it yeah. out of our hands as the responsible user, and we're right. putting it into the, the aircraft's hands. And inevitably, you know there's going to be problems and accidents with that. And, we, look, and when you guys want to get... Cars are going to be driving themselves in the next five years. Sure. You know? Right, but... Everything. Sure, but, right, if you are going to use that car to go monitor wildlife, you probably need to have, even though it might autopilot to the Definitely. field, you need to have the ability to safely operate it in unusual context. And yeah. what we talk about, what you guys are getting trained to do, is to, is to do things other than a wedding photographer does, right? You guys are going to different places or being prepared to be able to go to different places, different situations, and you guys will have the skill sets to adapt to whatever's there. Or a firm might have one of these, or your consulting firm might have one of those. And you don't want to go in there and say, oh, I know how to do this, but I don't know how to do that, right? You want to be uh, technology agnostic. You want to be able to be proficient in whatever uh, tools you have before you, because also, ultimately, that's better to answer the question. Because what we're all we're ultimately about, we're not flying here, we're ultimately about getting data. And so knowing all these capacities, maybe this is the perfect product. Maybe that's the perfect product. Maybe one of those things can do it. And one of these things, if you crash it into the endangered condor, it's not going to hurt it. This thing will chop it up into, right? So there's, those, those are all, I was just at a wilderness training uh, last two days for the Channel Islands. And those are real concerns that people have, especially people that don't know anything about this technology. And so they, they're, you know, maybe won't approve the use of this, even if this might be the ultimate tool to get your you know, data, but they might approve something more along that scale, right? And so, so we want to keep the palette open and the palette wide so that you guys are able to operate successfully regardless of the situation. Yeah, and I think what we're getting to is like, don't, I'm not trying to discourage you in any way, but don't get caught up in some of these features. Um, and instead, 
what I've been looking at, like that the, the Phantom that came out, you know, it had exactly. essentially it creates a point cloud as it's flying. Well, to me, that's not. I could care less about whether I run into the tree or not because I know I'm not going to run into the tree. <laughs> but 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 the fact that it's creating that data, well, where I, I my brain started thinking, well, how is there a way to you know, get that data out the other end. Right. If this thing's flying around and it's taking, I don't know how it's exactly doing it, I don't know enough about it yet, but I mean, that those are the things that I'm encouraging you guys to look for. Yeah. And, and yeah, as a basic safety net, knowing that that thing shouldn't run into the tree is great to know in the back of your mind to say, okay, it shouldn't, but we're not gonna rely on any of this stuff. Is that That's kind of what we're getting to here. Yeah, and, and then the last example, I think I've told you guys this before, but with, the, with our Inspire, we're in the Cook Islands, uh, we updated the firmware before we left, which we shouldn't have done, because it uploaded the new map, the new liability concerns, and people don't want these flying next to an airport, right? So they uploaded this global map of airports, and even though our airport, the part of the airport we were, hadn't been used since 1940s, and some map on whatever, it showed up as a thing. So when we first took this off at the beach, you know, in a safe area, the planes weren't flying, we're all good, the thing immediately flew out to sea, right? And it was like, it was in a no -fly zone. oh my God, we're gonna lose this thing out in the middle of the ocean, right? So thankfully we got under control and all this and that, but, but um, right? So that's, there's a downside about autonomy when you are doing the things we're doing. And a lot of times having less autonomous is better to, uh, if, you, if you guys are proficient, so. How'd you guys get it back? Well, first we start praying. <laughs> and then uh, and, and we were able to pull it back and just stop it from going any further and then we went out to a patch reef which you guys should never do and then we lowered it and grabbed it and killed the power but but it, otherwise it was it was trying to full stick away and and then we yeah we fixed it after but um, yeah so, so the inspire this inspire originally came with these props um, plastic props and um, and you see one of them's got a black cap the other a silver it's the way they rotate and the way they're, it reminds you which way to put them on. And because um, I went to a heavier camera, I wanted to get a little more lift, and I, I went to uh, a carbon fiber prop, which is much more rigid. They both spin off here, I'll pass them around, and you can feel the difference in the flexibility of them. Would you just briefly go over the rotation of the blades and the high and low sides? about which leading uh, edge. You cover that. What's that? Uh, well, I'll, I'll let him cover the air. DGI has a proprietary numbering system on their aircraft. So you see your quad, the upper right quarter. Don't, don't you always want to do yeah, yeah. that? Yeah. Number one is counterclockwise. Always spin, the, so all your odd numbers are counterclockwise. And they count their motors counterclockwise. So left is two. Yeah. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or coaxial. Yeah. So all even numbers rotate clockwise, odds counterclockwise. So always start at that top right and count counterclockwise on DGI equipment. Yeah, there's various ways. Some of the props now won't let you go, they'll only go on one one of them, so you can't put them on back to the wrong ones or they have like a little mark, like a white dot that'll go on. But if you notice what's what's uh well, these are all quads, but like, if we stepped up to the bigger stuff, what I mean, what numbers are we dealing with here, right? Four, six, eight, ten, twelve. It's all even numbers, and that's done on purpose. Uh, you know, traditional style helicopter, right? We got the main rotor blade that spins, and then we have the tail rotor. That tail rotor, you guys know what it does? It stabilizes it from what? Rotating. Rotating, exactly, because without that tail rotor, that whole aircraft, the, the whole fuselage, actually Stan would know best, because he's, he's a co commercial helicopter pilot, so I'll let him explain. But, yeah, why don't you explain how that works real fast? Well, and then and then how these work, the, the difference between the two, yeah. given the fact that they're even numbers and all that stuff. Well, it, it, it's actually very similar, but I mean, it, you're preventing, tail rotor prevents yaw, mm -hmm. it's that simple, and uh, if you ever seen videos of uh, a helicopter losing uh, its tail rotor, you'll see it starts spinning and there's things pilots do to try to counteract some of that to, to land. But um, in this case, because you have counter rotating props, you know, the, the intelligence is when, when you're doing inputs, the intelligence 
of the uh, of the machine is telling it which prop, which motor, you know, to accelerate and to decelerate, and and you know it's pretty complicated. And I'm not an instructor, so I don't. Sure, sure. <laughs> we're getting we're getting to the point that it's all even numbers, right? Because right. if we put an odd number in there, then we have three or one more do, rotating one direction more than the other one. So it it it. it then your whole aircraft theoretically would start to spin one direction. Yeah, so they tried couplers, but they use some sort of way to move the. Yeah, they put it on a servo. Sure. The yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, most of the tricopters too, though. The, uh, yeah, you're right. But then they also have ones that are that they're tricopter in design, but they're actually hex rotors because they have two on or three rotors on top and three rotors on the bottom. Right. That's how they counter. Well, and even even with the hexes, now you can lose. They say you can lose a motor and still yes. control it. Sure. Um, I haven't had that opportunity to, that yet. <laughs> it's still to confirm that room. I, I've had a hex, and but I've sure. never lost one. It's just, just kind of like a slow rotation, right? Um, that is controlled. We can actually show you that video next Tuesday because our massive our hex is bigger than this table. So we had an ESC pop in flight. Wow! And uh, the pilot, who's uh, got thousands of hours of multi rotation, he flies 200 days a year commercially. He recovered and landed it safely. And the next time he took it up, one of the motors failed, and then a second motor failed, and he still landed it. And that's that's the advantage to flying something like a DGI product because they make great evolutionary progress in their flight control algorithms, and they also, from X on up, they can self-heal to a certain extent. They'll start shifting control algorithms over to the remaining functioning ESCs and motors give you a hard landing. It'll do some strange yaw, it may dip, but it'll recover eventually if you get what we call flying 10 mistakes high, and then land without destroying the entire you know sure. sure. So, I, I don't think we've gone through some of the basic nomenclature of the that Dan was referring to on some of this stuff, just to, it's not something that you necessarily need, but I'll run it, I'll run you through it real quick, all right? So, uh, we obviously got the props and the motors down, everybody understands that, but what controls those, all right? They're not just motors connected to a battery. There's there's a couple things in line before you get there. So um, we're going from, we have the motor here, and then uh, we typically have three wires coming out of it, and it goes into, down here on the bottom, these are what he's saying is the ESCs, or the electronic speed controls. They're essentially attached, plus or minus a bunch of weird stuff in the way, but when you really hit any input on the stick here, that's what's telling that the, the control board in the center, so I, I guess I should step back one, one further. So connected to the ESCs is essentially a computer, all right? And the computer receives the input from the transmitter, and it says, the transmitter says, go right. So the computer processes, sends it to the ESC, and then the ESC gives the motor however much power it needs to go right or left. Without the ESC, essentially think of just having an on and off switch. That's all we would have. So you either have full power, and this thing's going to chop my hand right now, or you have no power. You have nothing in between. That's what the electronic speed control does. And then the computer is the processing part that Dan was talking about, that there's all kinds of algorithms and you know, way smarter people than me have just figured out how to make these things essentially fly. So that old style was old school remote control airplanes, right? It's more just turn it on, turn it off, or turn it on, right? It's, it's none of this computer-assisted stuff. It's all you uh, exactly. doing it manually. Yeah, so um, that's that's how a normal fixed wing would work. Uh, but now we're starting to integrate the same technology from the multi-rotors into those those fixed wing aircraft that has one there that helps, essentially there's a computer in there that controls, you know, a lot of different aspects of the aircraft. So those that's the basic nomenclature. Some other stuff on here that well, I'll let, I'll let you point it out if you want. Uh, Just the GPS sure, and the, well, the downlink and stuff. So yes. explain how we're getting data from the aircraft. Can we back up one yeah. step? In my opinion, because I've only been doing this 16 years, <laughs> the greatest feature that they introduced in the fan and the Inspire series is the automated data logger. So when he turns his aircraft on, it immediately populates a whole bunch of fields. It says battery status, number of time cycles, battery condition it's still in, your location, your flight durations, all that stuff that the FAA is going to require eventually either in the old-fashioned paper manuals, logs, and things like that, or you create your own log, which we've done, it's on paper, so you can show everybody 
you know, with this aircraft. Evidence. Do, where Evidence. Yep. So when if somebody could come up with an application, they're trying to do electronic flight logs. Yep. That can go that can go across the whole spectrum of systems. You're going to have something. We're doing a lot of stuff. We're trying to get an app or for smartphones, so you can do the same thing. Because what I'm finding with my guys is they're very resistant to filling out a paper form every right. time we take off. Right. Right. Because we have our 333 waiver. We're required to report to the FAA <coughs> monthly every time we use the commercial use the commercial where it flew, how long it flew. Even we have to report the battery status, how much reserve battery was left in that aircraft when we landed. So every flight. Every flight. So and they well, they have to send it in every, every recorded every flight yeah, and then just, send it in as a group. Right. And you guys should, we'll, we'll get to that, but if we, when we start flying, even these little ones, you can log that time. If, if you're, you know, it, it doesn't hurt. You never know where it's going to go, but that time is, it's not required as of right now, but it's definitely not bad to keep track of all the times that you've flown and where and all the, you know, whatever happens. So. And once you start numbering or labeling your batteries, you start recognizing their power curves. Right. Okay, that's why I'm, I'm, this looks fully charged. I'm only going to be in a flight. Oh, I have 35 charge discharge cycles. That's probably the end of that service life of that battery. Yeah, there's it just a, keeps track of that. Well, yeah, it does keep track of it. In fact, when I turned this one on, it told me I needed to fully discharge this battery. Yeah. And and what happens is, is in DJI software, it recalibrates the battery yeah. so that it'll give you their proper levels because they've had some battery issues with DJI, and they, I'm not sure they've still figured it all out. But um, So that's been one of the issues is you might be looking at 100% battery, and then all of a sudden it drops down. Right. 20% within a minute, right. and you're saying, well, what happened? Yeah. And the fact is, it, it, did, it wasn't calibrated properly, and so now the software tells you when to recalibrate your battery, which means discharging it, they're saying down to 3.1 volts. But uh, in the old days, like these guys, they recommended just tur turning it on on idle until it turned itself off. It's like, really? You're going to leave a spinning aircraft somewhere? It's running. There's a bunch of so, yeah, Todd will get into you know how to treat with the polymer batteries for charging, discharging, storage, and transit. So, yeah, we're. I think the goal right now is just to get your guys' brains wrapped around the flight aspects of it. Once we're getting to the point where hopefully we can get start going out to the field, we'll start yeah. putting in some more parameters of okay, this is what has to get done prior to us going um, and how we do it. Um, but I'm not gonna. I mean, I'm sure you guys. We get kind of off topic on right. a bunch of... Let's, let's get back to our parts, sure. our components. Okay, just real quickly. So uh, on top here, this is a GPS antenna. Obviously receives the transmission from GPS. These are the antennas for the transmitter for controlling the aircraft. This is the video antenna because it has the ability, like on the Inspire, this is not of the quality, but it transmits a video to either the goggles and or the uh, transmitter. Uh, and then there's one other thing, uh, there's a camera in front, it's a simple camera. Um, it, it's not able to, uh, to, this camera's not able to record video, but just to give you the view on the transmitter or the goggles. But um, this is a, this aircraft does a good, uh, good work with problems of orientation. It's got really bright white lights for the front and bright LED uh, red lights in the, in the back. And these are actually blinkers, which when you're flying fast or with something this small, far away, actually can when help you, or flying at night, just orientate you to, you know, are you turning, are you spinning? You know, it, it, the orientation is, is such a big deal, especially something small. And, and if you're at 100 yards away, you, it's very tough to sit, say what direction this is going. What, what's the speed on this? You know, um, it is a racing quad. It's not. It's not particularly fast. It's probably 40, 40 plus, maybe 45. I, I'm sure the Inspire is just as fast. Miles per hour. Yeah, miles per hour. What they, they, all like DJI's oh, systems? So you get up to the yeah. Inspire four. I mean the, the four. Are locked at 35 to 35 yeah. miles. Is that right? Because they, they only have to use it. Why don't you talk about the time? It's roughly uh, 10 minutes. It, it varies on how you're flying. You're fly, flying very aggressively. This, you could, it's made to capable of doing flips and barrel rolls. So that's like a, 
the difference is, is that's more for things. aerobatic and yeah. it's much more on the recreational side of things. Yes. These are more for some kind of data collection, uh, in this case, photos or videos. So it's, it's totally two different mindsets of flying. It's not one's right or wrong, but the, you're flying that, it's, they actually race them, and it's a ton of fun, but the, I mean, if you crash, everyone cheers and, and laughs. But, you know, we crash this, everyone goes, oh no, you know, so there's, it's just a total different mindset. And those are typically tuned very, very, uh, I don't know what the right word would be, but like hot, meaning like when you touch the sticks, it's going to move real quick and move all around. Whereas when, we, when we're doing stuff like data collection, a lot of times we want to dub all that stuff really, really down so that we have everything, we're, uh, the aircraft's going to fly really smoothly through the air, it's going to give us smooth video, and or it's going to just be under our control on a lot better circumstances. You guys can all attest to that. Is that um, there, there's a bunch of features we can we can do to help with that, and that's later down the road. These little ones do not have any of those capabilities, really. So, uh, but we'll, you'll learn about it once we get out in the field and get to play with that. Do you guys have any experience with the Pix 4D yet? Yeah. So the Phantom 2 Vision Plus is fully compatible with the Pix 4D. Right, and so yeah, so 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 that that doesn't just have the information on the camera; it has all kinds of other stuff like inertial stuff, orientation that really helps with the image processing that you don't need for Pix4D, but dramatically helps the algorithms and stuff. Pix4D is what you're using over there, right? Dr. Is it, yeah, I'm, I'm processing some is stuff that, that we that's took. Santa Clara, Santa right, but that's yeah. that's for that's for later. <laughs> so we're saving that. So let's keep focusing on our our that's demo. The you're looking for. Yeah, that, yeah. So don't look at that screen. <laughs> I, think, I mean, we kind of run through it. I, I mean, we could go into each one of these aircraft and run you through all the features, and we'd be here till tomorrow. You know, I think um, each the, the point of this is every aircraft is a little bit different, and they all have different pros and cons to them. Um, they all have the same basic uh, components, which are essentially you know a propeller, a motor, speed control, and a, a control board in the center. Those are and a battery, right? Those are all pretty much synonymous with all the aircraft, um, but they all just come ready to go in different ways. So it really gets down to when we start thinking about like field work, what is our end goal? What are we going to collect here? And then what tool are we going to use to help do so? You know, um, and then and then go from there. Yeah, and a, and a great one related to this that you guys are not required to do this, but if you're so uh, so interested, I think from our lab meeting this morning, what I think we're going to do is on um, it's the 31st, I think I'll have to double check, but I believe it's uh, the week after spring break, uh, that Thursday, we're going to um, hopefully start breaking down all our uh, 3DI products that we were given. Uh, 3D art? Why did I say 3DI? Jeez, man, I'm I'm merging companies now. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so a lot of that is pulling things apart, right? And so we have a, a quad and, you know, who knows? We have 18 irises, for example. And so so maybe one, the, the motors are all good, and then one, maybe the frame is broken. And so it's really just going to be about starting to pull things apart. And that's a great opportunity, if you guys are interested in these component stuff, is to help with pulling those these apart. We're basically going to pull them apart and then put them into piles of throwaway, you know, can repair or actually, you know, a, a good to go component. Um, so, if you guys are so interested, I'll I'll include you in those emails. But you do you do not you guys do not are not required to do that. But but that's for my research uh, students are going to be working on that. But you guys are all welcome. Last thing I just want to point out um, is safety involved. Stand right out of the bat. You know, you pulled this, put it together, powered it up, and there's no props on any of this stuff. Um, for our class, these are not really removable, and anything smaller than that's not really easily removable. So it just is what it is. Um, these will still give you a little cut, especially if you get it to your eye, it might do some damage. So be be wary of that. But anything that we move up to this size, I do not want to see any props on it while we're in, unless we're getting flight ready, and it's gonna. And everybody knows, which most likely won't happen inside. Um, there should not be any propellers on any of the aircraft. Okay, so just it's a big safety consideration because right now Stan can go ahead and fire that up, and I mean, if you're dumb enough to stick your finger in there, you might get a little, you know little bird on it but it's not going to hurt anybody right now and so we can do a lot of testing and things that you way. mean you mean with the with the blades without off. The props off right yeah right. And we can do a lot with without the props to make sure everything's working what the way we want it to and I know sometimes it's a pain to take the props on and off and I think I should do this before but I, I have completely chopped my finger in half with with a prop um, 
very similar to the size that Stan showed. Like I was just lucky it, I actually didn't lose my finger because it went straight down my finger instead of sideways like that. Um, so it's, it's a big safety concern for us. Um, all right, guys, so that's that. I think unless somebody else has what, anything else, I was going to do a quick flight with this of what, what I'd like to have you see, and then we'll do kind of one by one. I know I know you guys don't feel embarrassed, but like let's just let's just get people up here to fly. Yeah, on the other room. Let's